All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the International Center for Co-op Management out of the Sobe School of Business at St. Mary's University. You are in the right place if this is what you came here for today, Cooperatives in the, in the Digital Age, Digital Maturity, Data and Transition. So our focus today is really looking at that intersection of where our economy is really moving in terms of digital maturity and the call for all of us to, to move in these ways um, and cooperatives as a business model and enterprise model. Uh, so we'll talk about lots of different things, data sovereignty, member experience, um, certainly the use of data and, uh, and all of the other technology improvements and challenges that we have as we move forward into our current <laughs> and emerging economy. Um, so we've set this up with a couple of really amazing speakers here today, but we also want this to feel like a forum for every, everyone. So we have this set up as a meeting in Zoom. So that means that you can see everybody in the participant list. You can add to the chat. You can message people directly or to everyone. So please do participate like that. Um, please do share your comments and ideas. Four, 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 three, four, nine. That's, uh, that's how I like to enter a room. <laughs> Thanks for the audio there. Um, and so, so please do add your comments, questions, and chat throughout. We have many special folks here on the line today, including our uh, master's and, uh, and graduate diploma students here as part of their digital transformation course. So we hope that those folks are particularly active today in, in sharing. And towards the end, we're going to open up so people can you know, show their video, share the, their voice live as well. Um, so I did want to underscore as well that we have uh, one of the featured speakers, Bob, today is from SAOS in Scotland, and we've just released a, a, a case study on that cooperative. So that case study focused more on, on sort of uh, membership and governance experience within their cooperative, which they have very many, very um, innovative uh, ways of engaging folks. So we encourage you to do that. Uh, go check out that case study. And we might not hear about all of those themes today, but certainly more innovative. I think to share of interest to this group and uh, I'll click a link into the chat there in a minute uh, when I'm done speaking as well and just to say as well we have a number of other case studies and uh, released works that are free and open for everyone I know that a lot of the time we're looking for these great examples of cooperative governance in particular in, in a lot of these cases uh, and so please do go there and use those and learn from those and create study groups around those as you wish. I wanted to underscore as well that we have uh, open applications still for our three online part-time programs, our certificate graduate diploma and master's program in co-op and credit union management. And so we do have a few seats left in each of those programs. The application deadline is next week. If you're hearing about this for the first time and you're excited, then please do just reach out to me. I'll put my email there as well and you'll get a follow-up email after this webinar with the link to the recording and, and some of these other things that I'm mentioning as well. And, and if you are interested in any of these things reach out we can consider extending the deadline for you if you need the time so now I'll move on to introducing our two featured speakers today. So they are special, not just because they're brilliant and doing really great things, but because they're both graduates of our Master of Management Co-ops and Credit Unions program as well. Uh, it's always great to keep people in the family and to see people, you know, innovating and, and supporting a lot of these transformations that cooperatives are going through and, and to see people leading the way. So um, Bob's going to be our first speaker today. So I'll start with introducing him. So he hails from a family of dairy farmers and tomato growers. Uh, the importance of common ownership by farmers was instilled at the start of his career, setting up a farmer's co-op under the guidance of his economics tutor at Aberdeen, which took apricot computers onto farms uh, from 1982, providing budgets using the financial calculator developed at Reading University. So you can see that sort of interest in digital transformation, even the egg space uh, has been happening for a long time for Bob. Uh, this was followed by managing Invermarkey Farms and Estate for James Ingleby, a member of five cooperatives for the marketing of seed potatoes, grain, cattle and sheep, timber, plus a purchase of inputs. Um, and Bob uh, took on the ownership and governance uh, by agriculture of its supply chains, providing cost savings, added value, and most importantly, the latest intelligence within his role. 
Um, and his main career since has been with the Scottish Agricultural Organization Society, and currently he serves as a Def deputy chief executive. And he's also the managing director of scotteid.com, which I'll let him tell you more about in a minute. But I also want to introduce Deborah Moore, our second speaker today. She holds the Master of Management Co-ops and Credit Unions and has over 20 years experience leading digital transformation strategies across multiple business lines at Van City and Citizens Bank. Uh, Deborah currently leads Celera Solutions Open Banking Marketplace Program, as well as consulting business advising credit unions on their digital strategies and preparing them for emerging digital economy, including open banking. She's a member of Digital Identity and Authentication Council of Canada's Innovation Expert Committee and actively contributes to the system's ongoing open banking dialogue, including participating throughout the federal government's open banking consultation process. So uh, I would be remiss, and I apologize, I jumped right in without doing our land acknowledgement as well. So St. Mary's University is located on the unceded and never surrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And of course, many of us are involved in place-based development and partnership. And so it's critical for us to look at the history and the relationship of the land and also the treaties that govern our land. Uh, which is an ongoing process for us uh, at the center and, and in our wider university. And also I should say that I'm Erin Hancock. I am the education manager with the center and very happy to be your liaison with all the things that we do at the center. So I will now hand it over to Bob to take the floor. And uh, Bob, if you have any introduction music as you take the stage, you go ahead and play that now as well. <laughs> Oh, there you go. So you can hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, you've no, you're nodding your head, so that's fine. Thanks very much. So, um, so thanks a million for uh, asking me to come along and, and speak uh, this afternoon and a glorious uh, afternoon here in Scotland. And I do hope that you can all understand my strange accent, really. Um, I often had a lot of laughs in Canada, the way that uh, we roll our R's and all the rest of it. So, so uh, <laughs> Please, if, you, if nothing else, enjoy the accent. I um, was one in the first cohort that, that uh, studied at um, St. Mary's University. I do notice, I think I just saw Tom Webb come on um, there. I don't know, Tom, if you're there. So um, great to see you if you are. Um, so hello. And Tom was a severe ta taskmaster at the time. And uh, I still have the scars on my back from that, I can assure you. What was what was clear to me is is that it, it did change my career felt, uh, profoundly, really, with respect to you know the three years master's course, um, and that actually of SOS itself, Scottish Agricultural Organisation Society, and and the reason for that I think is, and I'm maybe just a little bit dim, but it did take three years to really get to the core for me of the power of the principles of cooperation. And since then, you know, it's quite a few years ago, that's guided the, the, the way that we've looked at cooperation here in Scotland uh, in particular and, and the power of these principles. And to be honest with you, 15 years ago, we had forgotten about them, if we ever really learned about them at all. Um, and, you know, I'm going to switch really to and jump really to the data side of, of, of life really. And, but the, the, the issue here was, is that we had a very traditional way of setting up our cooperatives. You know, you set up a nice ginger group, you had a driving ambition, you know, whether it was to build a new grain store, you know, or, or uh, set up a milk cooperative or whatever. And you set up a ginger group and really that became the board of directors and you invited your members and you had a, had a single driver and a set of objectives and a business plan and raise capital, et cetera, et cetera. So if you, if you can move to the next slide, uh, please. Uh, um, so it's easy to have a vision, uh, you know, where there's something physical that you're doing, as it were. And I guess, when we started thinking really, and we're, I'm, we're going back, I'm going back now 20 years, and certainly um, then the kind of thought process of 15 years ago. And we knew then, we knew then that we were going to start to 
run into issues with respect to our environment. Um, and we were starting to think deeply about that. And, and so our own vision inside SOS was to look at what are, might be the intelligent data systems of animal crop and the, you know, our ecology really, and the interaction between all of these. And we started to understand that modern data systems are, it wasn't that modern, you know, modern, it was modern at the time, um, was, was gonna start to drive how we, how we measured progress. And our thinking at that time was, how do we make that sure that that's owned by our community, for our community? The problem was, is, is that when you get a bunch of farmers or farmers together, to build a new grain store is pretty easy. But when the vision is a bit more nebulous, it's really tricky. And so at SOS, we start, we really brought the development much closer to ourselves. If, if you move to the next slide, Erin, please. And this really became the driver, the climate emergency. And of course, that has been going up and up and up and up in the in, you know in the thought processes now, and it's real. It's more real than anything you can ever believe, really. Um, and the most sensitive uh, touch point for the climate emergency is actually food production. Without a doubt, it's food production. And of course, it's tr it's difficult because in political levels, they're pretty far removed from it. Um, you know that association between climate and um, and the reality, really, and the, and the, and the change in climate. So, if you move to the next slide, Aaron, thanks very much. So, what we have at the minute, and uh, I hope I don't need to apologise for saying this, but our whole our whole um, economy is driven by rich old men who really don't care about the climate and what we're doing. They don't care that we're burning nearly 100 million barrels of oil every single day, it's, 90, it's about 96, and exactly the same in coal and coal equivalent. And uh, you know, if you ever get some time, go and work out what that actually means. Um, and it's, it's, it's just astonishing. And we're not making any moves. So, I put this slide up here because the people who are going to be affected are, are the youngsters right across the world, okay? And interestingly for our industry is that a lot of focus has been put on rumen animals um, and their production of methane. And our view is, is that that actually is dragging the notion away. It's, it's, uh, I'm trying to find the right word here. Um, but it's obfuscating the real issue of burning enormous amounts of uh, fossil fuel. Um, and so we really started thinking about what are the key drivers. If you go to the next slide, Aaron, please. And so the key drivers of, of what we're looking at doing within the data systems are, you know, efficient food production, measuring the causes and effects on, on, on our in, in environment and look, you know, looking at how do, we, how do we engage in our knowledge of what is actually good and proper for the, uh, for the ecology and the ecology in, the, in its widest sense. And we have to be able to measure this. Now, what we're doing is, is that we have built our systems to do th these three things here. And we're continuing to do that. And the data um, is, is owned and provided by, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, by the, the data providers who are rural dwellers and, and, uh, and farmers. If you move to the, to the next slide. And you might ask, somebody might ask, then what are the barriers to, to this development and, and data systems? Well, we were lucky enough to remove one of the biggest ones, which was to circumnavigate a little bit the traditional way of setting up a cooperative um, and go directly to the, to, to the issue um, and allow farmers, as it were, and, and other people, you know, government, um, other organizations to really catch us up. But by that time, we, 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 we own 
the data and we have the data. But the but the the real barrier, you know, has 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 gone because you can simply argue the legitimacy and the urgency and the rationality of the drivers, and the driver is is, is the is the climate emergency itself. So if we go to the last slide, um, thanks, Erin. So I've spoken a little bit about that the data providers own their data, but here's the question: a lot of people look at data. And data is is neither here nor there, really. It, it, you know, it's volumes of, of, of information. The question is, is who owns and governs the intelligence that's derived from the data? Who owns that intelligence? Who owns the intelligence that says that our bee population is declining and what do we have to do to reverse it? Who owns the intelligence that says that our peat bogs are drying a little bit, so we've got to, we've got to, um, reverse that and we'll have to measure it you know we'll have to you know block drains and, and measure the water levels coming up and all that etc cetera, etc cetera. who's going to own the intelligence with respect to the efficiency of animal production what's the what's the right ratio of using crop to grow animals to then eat the animals you know how much crop should go to uh, to feed humans directly and then we, we started to ask ourselves what does ownership in this respect mean and this is a very interesting point, and, and, and I'm going to leave this as perhaps a discussion here. Because if you go back to the traditional way of, of a cooperative, I talked about, um, you know, you raise capital. And of course, part of the capital raising, you know, is, is, is recognized as shares. And so therefore you own your shares and you have one vote. And um, it doesn't matter how many shares you have, one member, one vote principle um, that, that, that sits behind that and drives the drives the, um, you know, the democracy within our co-op itself. But actually, <laughs> you know, what is a share? It's a, it's, it's, it's a measure of ownership. And, and the measure of ownership now, as far as we're concerned, in our, in our very significantly large data cooperative we've got, which is called Scott EID, you know, with uh, probably, so, you know, I can't remember the last count, but you're looking at 20 odd thousand members, 22, 23,000 members is that their ownership there and their governance is through the data itself. And that takes us to the next point here is, is how do we treat the intelligence that we, we drive out of that data system? How do we treat that as a co-op asset? And we haven't quite, I'll admit right now, we haven't quite figured this, these next steps because where we are at the minute with Scott EID is we have more intelligence than government. We have more intelligence than, than the very large co um, retailers. We, we have more intelligence than many of the institutions. And so we're able to use that intelligence, in other words, facts-based intelligence, to have proper negotiation for our community with the rest of the community. So we're able to express what it means, what the climate emergency means with respect to food production. We're able to express um, what the what the kind of um, the 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 skewed marketplaces that we are with respect to food, um, and how that's skewed by the enormous pressures within our, our, our standard sort of neoliberal, as it were, marketing um, a thought process, where the price of food has constantly got to be driven down. Um, and that's going to start to slowly reverse now. So that's where we are at the minute. I, I, I hope I haven't gone past my uh, 10 minutes, really. Um, and that's what I want to leave you with, is how do, how as a cooperative, um, right across the board, we treat the intelligence as a cooperative asset and how we look at data and the intelligence actually as the cooperative share itself, um, intermingled, you know, in driving the governance of the co-op. And these are these are real questions for us now, at the point that, that you know where we are of, of twelve years now of developing our amazing data systems. So that's me, really. I think, and uh, I'll be absolutely delighted to take any questions to that. Um, and if anybody at any point wants to um, send me an email or write to me, uh, I'll be uh, I'll be delighted to, to to answer any of these questions. So thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much, Bob. And I wonder while you have the floor, because I know that you're you're so thoughtful about the member engagement and member voice within SAOS, do you want to talk about 
um, any of the sort of digital interventions in that space and or choosing not to go digital in some ways? Yeah, thanks Erin for that because it, you know in 10 minutes I can only explain just a little bit about what what we do. What, what's fundamental in, in this whole process is data itself is as dead as dead and 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 the and the, what we've built is that interaction with people directly. So through Scott EID, we we handle about four thousand four and a half thousand calls every month. We speak to four and a half thousand of our members every single month um, through Scott EID. As as we develop that interaction between the data and intelligence itself and people's needs and requirements with respect to that, and we also cross over into the needs of, of government or the inspectorate, you know, you know, with respect to um, what we're doing and or any aspects of the of, of the food chain. And what we do is, is we we keep it, we keep many thought processes actually to ourselves because that's where our competitive edge comes from. Um, you know, within within our membership itself. So I hope that data itself. You, you know, you don't look at a data a co-op itself as just simply the data. You look at the data and the intelligence and the interaction with the people and the members who create and develop that data and their needs and wants and association with that data. You, you, you need to see it anyway. But the best statistic for us would be is, um, is the number. You know, we have, as I said, about uh, 20, 20 odd thousand or just over 20,000 members and we'll speak to 4,000 of them every single month. Wow, amazing. Thank you very much, Bob. That's perfect. That's great to kick us off. Um, and then we'll we'll bring Deborah to the floor now to give a little bit of the context from sort of financial cooperatives, the credit union sector and digital transformation and everything, <laughs> including open banking and a lot of things that, that Deborah's gonna talk on. And then again, we'll move into the forum where you all can share about your experience and ask your hard hitting questions mm -hmm. to our featured speakers. So over to you, Deb. Thanks so much for being here. Well, I'm so honored to be here with uh, St. Mary's again, uh, my alma mater, uh, to present to all of you. So uh, I have to say that I personally, it was very rewarding for me to go through that program and, uh, and I leverage the learnings and the relationships I've developed uh, along the way every day. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, so a little bit about Solero, perhaps Matt. many of you may not be familiar with who Solero is. Solero Solutions is a digital technology and integration company. Um, we provide a whole uh, range or comprehensive range of uh, financial technology uh, and payment solutions to credit unions across Canada. Um, our mission is to deliver financial technology and expertise through both our innovative mindset and most importantly, our cooperative values um, so that we can support our credit unions um, in delivering financial well-being to their members. So we're really focused on that and member in, in the services that we provide. Uh, I mentioned that, that we provide a whole host of different services, and I think this is important uh, context for some of the information I'm going to share in a few minutes, but um, we started in about 2003, 2004 uh, to provide uh, technology services to uh, credit unions in the Prairie provinces. Uh, so we became that IT shop of the uh, many of the Prairie Credit Unions. And today we've expanded out the types of services, a whole range of technology and professional services that we provide out uh, to the credit unions. Uh, and some credit unions take uh, a selection of those and some of them completely outsource uh, their services uh, to us. And at the foundation of all of this work is our integration layer. We provide an integration platform um, that, uh, it, that exposes the data that is needed and integrates that into the various services that are delivering uh, direct services to, to members in each of these credit unions. So I mentioned that we, uh, we started off uh, providing services directly to Prairie uh, Centrals, uh, Prairie, Prairie credit unions, I mean, uh, and we are cooperatively owned uh, by the three uh, centrals in the in the Prairie provinces. Uh, from from uh, some of you members uh, of, of, of the program here that are um, dialing in from uh, different jurisdictions outside of Canada, uh, just uh, for your awareness, 
Uh, most credit unions, primarily credit unions in Canada, there are a few exceptions for federal credit unions, are provincially regulated. And as such, there are central credit unions in each of the provinces. So we are owned by the three prairies, uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta centrals. However, we provide and extend services out uh, to credit unions across uh, Canada. So maybe we can set the stage a little bit here on, on what, uh, what's happening within financial services and, and specifically what's impacting uh, credit unions and, and banks. Um, we're seeing a, a changing landscape and that changing landscape is, is driving new business models um, with uh, new emerging, and I say new, and I'll put new in quotes because it's really not new, uh, big tech and, and fintech that have come into the financial services space. Uh, challenger banks, uh, which are uh, digital first or digital only banks here in Canada, we have a few of those, Neo Banks, for example, or, or is, uh, is well known as well as well simple, that are all getting, gaining a market share in the Canadian landscape. There are in other jurisdictions, uh, there are digital platform plays where, um, for instance, in China and, and in India, so there's WeChat, Alipay, and Paytm in India. These are huge platforms that provide a whole range of different services back to consumers, not simply financial services. And each of those platforms have over a billion users um, where the, I call them lifestyle applications. And, and so that's, that's a trend that we're seeing. And here in Canada, we're seeing uh, some of the barriers to entry removed, as we see in, in other jurisdictions like UK um, and, and Australia, for example. But this is happening across the world with the introduction of open banking. So these types of regulatory changes are really changing the ecosystem and the financial ecosystem and competitive landscape uh, for financial services as they start to open up uh, to fintech and other third parties. I'm going to spend a little time talking about open banking because I think it's really relevant in, in um, uh, uh, from a data perspective and, and ties in nicely to what we heard from, from Bob. So um, currently, uh, in order to share data uh, from your bank or your credit union with a third party like a fintech, um, you have to use a process called screen scraping, where you share your credentials with that, with that uh, fintech, and then they pretend to be you, log in, and pull your data uh, so that they can provide you some value-added service. Uh, the challenge with that, there's a, a whole host of different challenges from a, from a risk perspective um, and a liability perspective for both the member and, and the financial institution. But at the, at the heart of it, uh, the consumer really doesn't own their data. And so um, in most cases, they don't, they don't own their data. They don't have control over how that FinTech is going to use the data, how much data is going to be pulled through that login, um, and how that data may then be stored and kept and when it might be expunged from their system, likely not even when they no longer need those services. So open debt banking, um, uh, introduces the concept of, of the, the member or the consumer owning their data. And it really shifts how data is then shared with third parties and how uh, FinTech become part of that ecosystem. So what it does is uses a technology called APIs, which is application programming interfaces, but it's a secure communication method for banks and credit unions to share the data with FinTech. Um, and, and what it's meant to do is create uh, more competition, more innovation, and also downward pressure on, on pricing while placing uh, the consumer, or in our case, the member in control of who has access to their data, for how long they have that access, uh, for what purpose they have that access, and when they want that uh, access to be removed. Um, before I talk about uh, you know, digital transformation generally, um, open banking will become a reality here in Canada in about 18 months. Um, so the, uh, recently last month, the, the feds um, uh, announced the uh, hiring of Abraham Tashian, who is uh, the open banking lead uh, for Canada. 
Um, after about a two year long consultation process, the, the government last year in, in August released the plan for open banking here in Canada, which included an 18 month window from the time of hiring of that lead. Um, there's three main phases uh, to the program. One is that data sharing that I just mentioned, but all with third parties, but also uh, payments. Payments, uh, the ability to write to data, uh, write data is, uh, is coming uh, after in a, in a second phase, and it's going to be aligned with uh, work already underway uh, for payment modernization. And then the third is the ability to port or uh, switch accounts um, between uh, institutions and, and create new accounts. And so this is, there's a lot of consumer iner inertia to being able to move your account, say from a bank to a credit union, because there's so much friction in the process and that's meant to remove some of those uh, barriers. So for credit unions, then, uh, this introduces opportunities to look at new business models, different ways to incorporate fintech within to their business models, perhaps acting as a fintech and providing services out to other third parties in ways of products and services. Um, and, and at the very least, um, ensuring uh, that um, they have the appropriate uh, security consent management flows and APIs in place to be able to support the sharing of data in a secure way that is aligned to the government's uh, regulations and technical standards that will be coming in place. So amidst all of this change, um, how do organizations really uh, look at their organization to transform? What does that really mean? We, we, we quickly jump to the technology, but we view digital transformation as really about embedding agility into all facets of your organization so that the organization can continuously learn, innovate, and evolve and adapt to these types of situations and real paradigm shifts in how financial services will be delivered um, moving forward. It requires creating a culture that rewards uh, failure and test and learn approach, taking hints from what uh, how fintechs operate and how they're able to be really very uh, customer focused, uh, shift to member centricity across all your uh, services that you provide uh, needs to look uh, at that lens as well. Um, from an organizational perspective, looking at how you collaborate not only internally, but how you collaborate uh, across traditional boundaries with uh, third parties or, um, uh, or com community service providers, for example, which would be a unique opportunity uh, for uh, cooperatives. And then building the data and analytics capabilities that help to fuel some of the experiences and the operational improvements that need to be in place to support the transformation of organizations. So as I mentioned, it's not all about the technology. Technology is a key enabler, absolutely, in building the right architecture and framework in place to support uh, that flexibility is important. But looking at your business model, how that business model may need to evolve over time and what opportunities and new business models are there for credit unions to seize. Looking also at how you operate, how work gets done in your organization and improving that operating model is another component. I already mentioned the data analytics and the, and the criticality for replacing in some cases how services are provided in person today. Credit unions have always um, had high loyalty uh, and satisfaction scores and, and really deeply understood the needs of their members. But when their members are no longer coming into the branch, as we've seen through COVID, how do you create that level of personalization and, and advice that's needed without those interactions occurring anymore? And then uh, at the heart of that is making sure that you have a strategy that is centered around digital. Uh, it's no longer the case where a digital strategy is something that's separate and bolted in. We know that organizations that are highly or, or very, very successful at uh, implementing digital initiatives have put digital at the core of their strategy. And a, folk, a key focus on the talent and culture of the organization is also required. Because I think that'll that's a real key learning. Um, as I as I work with organizations, I see this over and over again. It's those organizations that are able to make those cultural shifts that can sustain and continue their transformation to get the results that they need. 
And then finally, and just share a, a high level view of the transformation framework that we work with credit unions. So I'm a real firm believer in education and creating a shared understanding for, for some uh, folks uh, technology is still relatively new and having deep understanding and uh, some of the new complex ideas can be challenging. So starting with a, a, a real clear uh, shared understanding of what digital transformation means for an organization is really important across all levels of the organization leadership executive and, and, and their board, but also understanding what the digital maturity of the organization, where they're currently at and where there's opportunities um, uh, to, to build out uh, uh, the organization uh, more further and mature where they need to focus. And this is really centered around the digital ambition of the organization and understanding the real opportunity for things like open banking, which could be viewed as a threat in some cases, but also I think uh, it can be looked at as a, a, a key opportunity for members. Uh, the second step is there is, is, is founded and grounded on, and, and this is really tied into what Bob said around the experience, really understanding from a member perspective, what are their key needs? Um, asking questions like um, with a shift to a more digitally enabled economy, where are there marginalization happening, where are there, uh, there's issues of inclusion and um, supporting members and understanding what that experience needs to be. Uh, so following this member centric design process is, 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 is at the core. And uh, then that also means looking at their operations. And so by looking at their um, business architecture and their operations, we can now take both the member lens, how do the operations support that and feed that into building a strategy that is comprehensive for the organization. And then we get into the fun part of innovating and supporting that innovation in the organization and looking at how we execute quite differently in the past, following an iterative design process and transforming the workforce through that process. I think I'll also, um, before I, I end uh, my presentation here, I'll focus on that, that change piece. As I mentioned, uh, organizations that focus on the culture um, and making those, sh those people type shifts are really important. Having a program that really empowers folks uh, through change is really critical. And what we've seen has been uh, highly successful in, in delivering this kind of change um, that is continu continuous in nature um, because our, our, our uh, ecosystem around us, our environment and landscape, it continues to change at an increasingly rapid price at place as, uh, as the digital economy emerges. So that's what I had to, to present so far. I tried to get through that in rapid time. So hopefully I stayed in that's time. Great. You did, you both did great. And, and it's so neat to come at it in sort of two different kind of industry lenses as well, I think, because, uh, I mean, in both of, of those industries that you're operating in, there's huge push. There's huge push within the wider economy and, and you know, competition and whatever that looks like in terms of what members are seeing elsewhere and, and then wanting <laughs> and wanting a different experience in the co-op context. So um, I, I think that was just fantastic and, and certainly touched on a lot of those things. And, and also move beyond, and I think it was so great that you underscored that, Deb, um, that this isn't just about what technology do you implement, what are the challenges of implementing it, how does it deliver on the member experience, but also that there's a, a huge cultural component to that. And actually a question came up here in the chat that maybe we could address as well. I think it's a good one. And we'll start with maybe responses from you both and then also open it up to others to respond to. Um, what are the impacts you are seeing within cooperative organizations culture as we undergo this immense, immense digital movement? Do you want to start that? Yeah, from a cultural perspective, I think one of the key challenges is that uh, as, as organizations are, are focusing on, on shifting and modernizing their operations, um, there's capacity constraints. And, and I think that, um, that that remains, a, at least amongst credit unions, as a challenge is needing to modernize, to free up capacity, to, to redirect that to um, providing more value to the members and more value related activities. At the same time, um, being able to shore up and, um, and support the skill development that's required uh, for, for credit unions. So I, I think there is this, um, this tension 
between the capacity uh, in improving their operations, as well as having access to the type of skills and upskilling their teams um, to, to, to perform this work. One of the recommendations I, I put in place is using the work itself as a way to transform and build those skills. We know that we're all competing for the same time as skills, not just as credit unions across the credit union system, but across different industries, we're all looking for those same type of, say, for example, data related type skills. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Erin. I think I can, I'll give a, a, a slightly different, you know, another inflection on this. And that is, is that if you, if you go, if you look at the, the, the core principles with respect to uh, the, demo, you know, democracy itself, members participation, concern for the community and all the rest of it. One of the vital points in a co-op is, is an, you know, in shorthand, is an emotional connection between members and across the cooperative itself. Now, the danger that we th thought through and, and uh, in, in some respects still concerns us is that when you're looking at data, you remove that, that connection, that emotional connection because there is, no, there is no emotion in data, none whatsoever. You know, it's as what I said earlier on, it's as dead as dead can be until you bring it to life. And the way you bring it to life is, is the connection to people itself. And, and, and the role of the cooperative is to get that emotional interaction. Now, it's, it might sound a bit nebulous, but I can assure you that when you're in among it, that, that's what really, that, that, that really, really matters. Um, and that's what we're that's what we're really taking forward. And it's interesting because you know some of our data systems obviously have to interact with government. And funnily enough, government is unemotional as well. Now, now if if you want some proof in that, we've had two years or so of of connection through Zoom and you know and isolation, and the joy of us actually meeting face to face is that emotional context that's what everybody wanted to do is get rid of the mask as soon as possible and be able to connect uh, person to person and press the flesh and all the rest of it and and that's always concerned us is, is if we if our co-ops go far too far down the data side and not connect at an emotional level they're going to lose a little bit and and it's embedded inside the inside the the principles you know voluntary democratic autonomy independence, education, concern for the community. These are all emotional connects. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate that. It's great. Aaron, We're it's, having... Sorry, it's Mike here. Do you mind if I jump in with a question? Is that okay? Sure. And then I think we'll so, have uh, Paul and Dop, username Paul and Dop next. Go ahead. Uh, I'll try to make it quick. Um, Deb and Bob, thanks so much for your time. Um, my question is about um, co-ops kind of banding together to solve these uh, common digital problems. Um, we're all kind of facing the same issue, issues, whether it's governance, whether it's incorporating, um, you know, digitalness into, you know, every aspect of our, our, of our role. I'm just wondering if you guys can speak to your experiences partnering with other co-ops to solve common problems, and if you could maybe speak to why you don't think we see this more in the cooperative sector, um, co-ops coming together to to solve mutually these digital issues. I can jump in there and talk a little bit just because of the nature of the work that we do at Solero. We, you know, we're we are we're formed and and you know our our our, uh, our story started with uh, cooperatives, credit union, financial credit unions coming together to say we have common need in developing out uh, Solero and then now extending that because it was value to credit unions across Canada outside sort of that normal ownership structure. Um, so we not only do we provide those types of services and, and work with credit unions who have differing, differing needs, differing sizes. We, we, we provide services to credit unions that are very small uh, in the hundreds of millions to those in the multi-billion dollars and having some very distinct needs amongst those groups. So you end up um, working in sort of collaborative kind of groups based on some common needs. So we definitely created that adeptness, but it's also the other providers and, and many other kind of, um, uh, I wanna call them buying or collaborative groups that credit unions uh, participate in as well. 
uh, other technology providers that provide similar services, but maybe somewhat different, we need to be able to integrate to them. So it's this, uh, this almost complex uh, network of families that need to collaborate and work together. And you're right, governance can be a challenge uh, in, those, in, in, in those kinds of environments. And I think that that's always a working in progress. I think, you know, when we look at cooperation amongst the cooperatives, it's our superpower, right? That is our absolute superpower. It's our nemesis as well, or our Achilles heel. And it, in different days, we probably look at it from a different perspective. Um, and I also think when you look at cooperatives in general, the level of cooperativeness, uh, the level of adherence to the values and, and principles are different. And, and we know this as a cooperative sector is that there's just varying. So I think that's where, where sometimes we, we end up with some, some differences and, and challenges. Yeah, uh, uh, the SOS itself, Scottish Agricultural Organization itself is owned by all our cooperatives uh, in Scotland and therefore we are the conduit for cooperative working with other cooperatives. And I'll tell you, it's hell. Because the reality is a lot of cooperatives compete with other cooperatives because they have to live in this fanciful sort of neoliberal um, methodology for um, economic uh, that drives economics. And, and, it's, and it's tough. It's actually, I believe it's the toughest of all the principles. And it should be the easiest, but it just isn't. <laughs> and I'm just going to leave it there, to be honest with you. We do, we do our best, but for goodness sake, don't take it for granted that co a cooperative will, will work with another cooperative. Um, again, it actually often comes down to the boards of directors themselves, you know, and they, they kind of, you know, they, 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 yeah, in a way that competitive edge, but, but, sim but simply because it's, it can be complicated to do, actually, and use a lot of time and not really drive any big changes. So I'll, I'll be brutally honest, it's a tough business, but we do it, I think we do it well at SOS, you know, and uh, I guess we've had more than 100 years of experience in there, so I'm allowed to be honest. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> Very responsive, thank you guys so much, appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Bob and Deb. Uh, username Paul and Deb, do you want to introduce yourself and offer your question? Um, yes. Pleasure. Uh, my name is Paul Lindop. I'm like Bob, ba based in the UK. Um, and in fact, we're a member of SAOS. We are Cool Smart Rural and we're a co op. So we're part of Bob's family and we do try and work with other co ops. <laughs> Hopefully, Bob remembers that. Um, <laughs> but as you, you might see on the video background, our mission is effectively monstrous it's the digital transformation of rural Scotland. Um, and that's centered through agriculture, but deals with all rural stakeholders. So it, it's, it's, yeah, it's the epitome of cooperation and not all bodies that usually cooperate, but being a co-op, dealing with non-co-ops actually helps us get a meeting. So just answering that last point of Bob's, yeah, sometimes co-op to co-op can be difficult, but going and dig, dealing with a big utility company to take on a shared goal, it's actually easier being a co-op. So, but the, the point of the question and something that crops up for us quite a lot because we've got this brief of digitalization of, shall we say, a, a population that's not, not best known for its digital maturity, data is a critical thing. And therefore, it's the questions of the panelists and the audience in general is sort of the, the relationships between the tools that we use that gather the data the analysis that happens and the people themselves, because every farmer is an individual, they regard every farm as being unique. But how do you bring that tool, the gathering, the analysis and the personal person together? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question, uh, Paul, because the tools themselves for gathering the data can be a little bit of myth and magic, as you know, you know, they're, they're, they're technically very, you know, quite difficult. They've got to go through uh, dashboards to be able to see the information that's driven by them. And then there has to be interpretation of the data coming out the other side. And I think, you know, what we've been, you know, I, I answered a little bit earlier with respect to the disconnect really between the tools that drive it and the people themselves and that, that 
how do you, not necessarily how do you get an emotional connection between the tools and, and the people, but the emotional connection between all of the people with respect to what's the right data and what's the correct data and the interpretation of that data. Because the interpretation of that data can do serious harm. I picked up, I picked up a, a, a question there by Tom Webb, uh, Tom, um, you know, because he says in his, in his question, and, and I'm paraphrasing, and maybe help me out, Tom, but, you know, is that in the, in the corporate world, you know, the, the interpretation of their intelligence is to increase return to investors. And of course, what's happening, if I'm being fairly honest about this, what's been happening is, is that return to investors within, let's say, our, our largest retailers, yeah, is based on cheapening food to the point that we're damaging the ecology and the environment. You know, to, you know, to have a cow that produces, let's say, 12,000 litres, or to have a wheat crop that produces four tonnes to the acre steady, you're actually raping either the animal or the ground itself. And the question for us, eh, Paul, I think, is what is the correct balance? And it's certainly not where it is just now. And, and the, the big retail sectors, and, and within that, I include the cooperative group itself, has got to understand much better that relationship between between sustainable food production, a terrible word sustainable, but sustainable long-term food production within a, within a changing climate and being able to measure the changes and connect that with people because it's people that make the change happen. So I'm sorry, that sounds like I'm not, you know, like a, I'm preaching now um, and, and, and my apologies for that. But that's what we are up to now. That's what we're doing now, Paul, I think, is, is, these, is these connections and having the evidence to be able to talk to the big corporations with the evidence and government and say, by the way, this is the damage that you're doing. And so you've got to, you've got to stop this. You, you cannot use market mechanisms, right? You cannot use market mechanisms to improve the ecology because it will rape the ecology. It's called externalization of cost, really. They'll externalize all of their costs to harm the environment that we're in. And that's exactly what the Exxons of this world are doing, the BPs of this world and the Shell, is they are, they are, they are externalizing all the cost of CO2 to the general environment, you know, for the only people. But I'm now preaching now, so my apologies. <laughs> I can't believe you think that Tom would have any issue with you preaching. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one, one thing that, that I'll add on, on that sort of data question is that you know, credit unions, um, uh, by virtue of being owned by their members, the data that they have is, is really owned by the membership. And I think um, when we look at uh, how, great, uh, how data is um, used and, and shared and managed, um, there's opportunities for credit unions and looking at how they apply those values to look at other social good purposes for how that data might be used, as well as how they can procure certain kinds of services. Um, and I think, you know, when we think about open banking and, and, and uh, how we partner, I think there's a whole question around trust and how my data is going to be used. There's an opportunity for credit unions uh, through that process to say these are trusted partners that meet certain kind of criteria that we work with. And therefore, you can know that if we're providing you access with those particular partners, that um, they're, they're ones that meet certain criteria that are of value uh, to the membership. Thank you. I wanted to just prompt everyone who's here today to add to the chat uh, what for you is the focus of, of digital maturity and digital transformation, whether that's naming a specific initiative that you're taking or an aspect of the business that you are working to move forward or change. Um, and also, if you want to add to the chat, what informs your digital transformation process, whether that's member feedback, you know, pressure from competitors or the wider marketplace, availability of technology, efficiency, just if you want to share any of that to what informs what you decide to prioritize for your digital maturity. I think it's all, you know, very interesting uh, to hear from your various perspectives. So go ahead and add any of your thoughts on that to the chat. It can just be bullet points. It doesn't have to be uh, full, full paragraphs or anything. And then we've had several other things coming up there. So um, I don't know if you've seen anything else come up in the chat that either of you really wanted to speak to. 
but um, there was a question earlier from James about um, speaking with members and educating them on data ownership and how that's conveyed um, to drive participation. Did either of you want to say anything? I know we've talked about it a bit. If you want to say anything more about that. No, I think I think what well, well, I just would say is, is reiterate and re-emphasize the opportunity there, particularly when um, uh, you know there right now there there's no um, educating members around providing uh, access to third parties that necess don't necessarily follow a sticker practices is a, isn't a great practice, but I don't think that's been highly successful. They don't have another alternative. But in the future, when open banking comes in, there's a huge opportunity to, to be part of that equation and, and really support um, members with understanding what does it mean to manage your data, how effectively, and then equipping them with the tools to do that effectively. Think about all of where you've shared your data in the past. And do you have a really good understanding of what kind of data footprint you out there you have out there today? Uh, I think providing members with the tools to help better manage uh, and incorporate education in that program is is important opportunity for sure. Thank you. And anything more from you on that one, Bob? Um, I think you need to paraphrase the question again. I was looking, sorry, I was looking through the chats there and <laughs> no problem. I've lost the thread just a little bit. So just about well, member education around data and their participation in, in the data of the co-op. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'll come back to what I said earlier on is that connection with people to people, you know, when they, and we do it, we really do it by telephone um, because there's an intimacy between people's own data and themselves. And, uh, you know, we have a, a pretty clever systems that, are able to interact at that level very very efficiently and and have a real connection um you know where we actually know the people then you know um we have our groupies you know people who phone every week because they want to here's a here's a here's an interesting one i mean i just want to go back just a little bit um to this emotional connection we we deal a lot more now with you know and it's come up the certainly in the uk it's come up the the agenda is is dealing with mental health problems and, and, and the mental health is, is, you know, in my view, is often because of remoteness. People feel remote, you know, that, that, that they're not connected. You cannot, you can connect through Facebook, but my God, it's pretty, pretty dry, awful stuff, really. And then, of course, if you're connecting through Twitter, you know, um, you, know it's, you know, it's an appalling piece of software, really. Um, it really is. It, it's just, you know, in invite it you know and you know i don't need to explain it you'll know fine if you actually look at the drivel you know um and of course you know the big rise of conspiracy theories and all that absolute nonsense and that's just people being disconnected from reality um and and in many respects that's why we've done everything we possibly can to connect with factual information factual information that really does support our members and factual information supporting our members to allow us to to negotiate properly within the marketplace, you know, at a level of what the truth actually is, and and I'm I'm you know if I'm allowed to express a concern, you know, with respect to climate and the climate emergency, is we will not face the bloody truth, we won't do it. You know, we're we're we've got to we're almost to get to a point where we can't buy bread off the shelves, and of course a lot of the a lot of the world can't buy bread bread off the shelves just now because they just can't afford it. You know, they simply can't afford it. So, so we've, got to, we've got to really work at these disconnects and be able to handle the truth that's driven from um, data rather than using it to, as Tom says, to enrich investors. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for participating today. We are reaching the hour. So I want to thank you very much to both of our speakers. And the chat is blowing up. So, so do take a look at that before folks depart today. We'll stay on for just a couple of minutes longer if you need us. But I will do a follow up email with the link to the recording. And also I'll include the chat notes in there and some of the links, uh, things that we've mentioned today. But thank you so much from the International Center for Co-op Management for joining us, for engaging in this. We'd 
love to in the future do a whole conference or symposia focused on this topic of digital maturity and cooperative specifically, but just to underscore, you know, the sharing of factual information, the upskilling of the teams, the connecting with folks at an emotional level, keeping cooperative principles, values, and our enterprise model at the forefront of any of our changes. I mean, those have certainly come up as, as big themes today. And I feel like we've uh, produced more questions than answers today, but I think that's the nature of, of this kind of transformation. So thank you again to the speakers and to everyone else who's here. Take good care and stay in touch. Everyone. Thank, thanks very much. Thanks so much. Thank you both for your time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great session. Thanks, everybody. I just at the last second got my little summary in there. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, on, it's on the record. <laughs>